Hi there, it's Mrs. Holman. Um, this is part two of the uh, intro to the reproductive system for my anatomy classes. Um, if you're here yesterday, we introduced um, the overall layout of the reproductive system. We talked about gender, develop, uh, gender de determination and we introduced the male portion of the, the reproductive system. Today, we are tackling the female reproductive system. We'll talk about the female cycle. We'll talk about uh, contraceptives, pregnancy, birth, and then complications with birth. Uh, we'll also talk about fetal and embryonic development. So um, let's go ahead and dive in, get started. So with the female reproductive system, all of the organs involved are uh, related to urination, intercourse, pregnancy, and childbirth. The five main organs that we'll focus on, of course there's more than that, but the ones we'll focus on are the ovaries, uterus, fallopian tubes, which are very commonly called the oviducts, uh, the vagina, and the cervix. So this shows a good example of the female anatomy. Again, um, just to mention that every individual differs by about 10% from any other given uh, individual in their species. So it's important to realize that this is what we call quote unquote normal anatomy, but it does differ depending on the individual. Um, we do see our typical bilateral symmetry in the female reproductive system. So we see that everything on the left is mirrored on the right. Um, therefore, there are two ovaries in females that are connected um, by oviducts or fallopian tubes. Those fallopian tubes have fringes at the end. Those little fringes will swoop up and gather the eggs that are released from the ovary and shuffle them towards the oviducts or the fallopian tubes. The oviducts then bend around and they connect and dump into the uterus. It kind of looks like an upside down pear shape. It's about the size of a human fist. Um, the uterus then has an upside down dome cap to it, which is called the cervix. The cervix is a very strong muscle. We'll learn that contributes towards um, labor and pregnancy. The cervix then opens up into the vaginal canal, um, and the vaginal canal then leads to the exterior of the anatomy. So on the exterior surface of the female, um, the very uh, outside folds are called the labia major and the labia minor. Um, Starting from the anterior side, the first structure that we come across is the clitoris. And um, if you remember back on the first screen cast, early on development, we have indifferentiated um, anatomy. So indifferentiated in that uh, it's not quite determined which gender you're going to become. And uh, that indifferentiated structure had a phallus. That phallus will develop in the presence of that SRY gene of testosterone. <clears throat> it will develop into the penis. If the SRI gene is not present and there's no influence of testosterone, that phallus will develop into the clitoris. Um, both of the functions are pretty much the same between the clitoris and the penis in that they're both the centers for arousal and sexual pleasure. Um, underneath the clitoris, we have the urethral opening, so that would connect to the urethra and the bladder. Um, and uh, posterior to that, we have the vaginal opening. Posterior to that, we have the anus, which is the end of the uh, digestive system and everybody's favorite sphincter. So looking at the internal anatomy for females, this is just a different view. This is a mid-sagittal view. Um, it allows us to see just one side of the symmetry of the uh, female anatomy. If we start top to bottom, we can see that the ovary and the fallopian tubes are located superior to the uterus. Um, the uterus is then superior to the bladder. Bladder is slightly anterior and inferior to the uterus. And this is a common um, connection because a lot of people who have experienced someone who's pregnant always talks about how the baby is pushing on the bladder, um, which is not that untrue. Um, underneath the bladder, or I should say in front of or anterior to the bladder, we have that would be the pubis bone, the white feature there. Um, that would be the part of the pelvis that, <clears throat> that is just anterior to the bladder. Um, if we keep moving south, or if we keep moving inferior, uh, we can see the labia major and labia minor. Um, and of course, we can see the cross-section of the end of the vertebral column and the rectum as well. So let's begin our study of uh, the physiology. So what happens in those structures that we just talked about? Um, so first of all, let's remind ourselves that the ovary is going to be the place where eggs are produced, um, stored, and matured. Um, and it's a good connection to our basic bio classes when we learned about the process of meiosis. So if you remember um, the process of cell division, if we are making normal somatic cells is mitosis. You can remember those are the divisions that make your toes. Um, meiosis are the cell divisions that only happen in the ovaries and the testes, and they are producing gametes. Why is that important? Well, uh, gametes are important because they have half the amount of genetic information. 
So if you remember that term diploid and haploid from yesterday's screencast, um, the gametes that are produced in meiosis are haploid gametes, meaning they only have 26 chromosomes, whereas normal somatic body cells will have 46. So let's talk about two specific hormones. Um, there are many more than just these two that go to influence the female reproductive cycle, but we're going to predominantly focus on estrogen and progesterone. So estrogen is responsible um, not only for its role in pregnancy and in developing those eggs, it's also responsible for those secondary sex characteristics that happen um, in females when puberty begins. Um, so it will help with the body development changes, the development of breasts, the development of the, the maturation of the ovulation cycle, um, just physical changes in the woman as she changes uh, uh, after puberty. The other thing that estrogen directly affects is going to be the uh, process of ovulation. So the increase of estrogen throughout the woman's 28-day monthly cycle is going to stimulate one of those um, eggs that are currently being housed in the ovary to be released, matured, and then swept into those fallopian tubes. Progesterone, the second, the second hormone that is directly influencing the female's reproductive system, is mainly in charge of that inner lining of the uterus called the endometrium level. Um, and the progesterone, as that egg is getting ready due to estrogen, the progesterone is getting uh, the egg a comfy place to rest once it becomes fertilized and it becomes implanted. So both of the estrogen and the progesterone help with this process called ovulation. Um, so ovulation is the term when an egg is released from the ovary. Um, this process happens when a female reaches those puberty years. And essentially ovulation involves that ovum um, developing a couple layers around it. Those layers will then be shed as the egg itself bursts out of the ovary and is swept away by the fallopian tubes. This process, process happens every 28 days and it alternates ovaries. So um, one month to the left, one month to the right. And it happens that uh, about 14 days through that cycle, that's when the egg would actually be released from the ovary and be in the fallopian tube. And we know that the fallopian tube is the most common place for um, the fertilization to occur. So let's talk about those fallopian tubes. Again, another common name for them are the oviducts. Um, and these tubes are about the size of a cooked piece of spaghetti, not angel hair, but regular spaghetti. So they are clearly visible to the naked eye. Later this year when we dissect, we'll be able to see the ovaries and the female caps that we dissect. Um, the oviducts will sweep the egg that was released from the ovary into the uterus. And they do this through a motion that we're actually already familiar with. So we learned in our digestive system unit that that term peristalsis means the slow concentric contractions of smooth muscle to move something in a direction. So um, peristalsis occurs in those fallopian tubes to help uh, move that egg along towards the uterus. Now, this is a slide that shows you the differences between a normal pregnancy and an ectopic pregnancy. We'll talk a little bit about ectopic pregnancies when we get into uh, uh, pregnancy complications, but I just wanted to show you that the comparison is that when an egg is normally fertilized, it should implant in the lining of the uterus, not in the lining of the fallopian tube. And we'll learn that that's a very dangerous <coughs> condition and that um, a lot of times it has to, to be um, surgically removed and it usually ends in the termination of the fetus. So a lot of you guys in the pre-survey uh, pre for this unit ask questions about twins, really good questions. Um, there are two main categories of twins that we've all pretty much heard of, and those are identical twins versus fraternal twins. So for identical twins, let's start there. Identical twins are caused when there is one sperm and one egg. And when those two, uh, two gametes meet, they create this thing called a zygote. So each and every one of us at one point in our lives existed in time and space as one cell. And all of the trillions of cells that you currently are made up of came from that one zygote. So twins, uh, identical twins, are when that one zygote early on in development um, actually cleave from each other. So instead of that zygote splitting into two cells and those two cells sticking to each other and developing into more and more, those two cells would actually separate and then continue to develop. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that those two cells would have genetically identical DNA. So that's the reason why so many of the features of identical twins are identical, because they have the same um, instructions, same blueprints for making that human. Now, if you know any identical twins in your life, and I know at our school we have quite a few sets, 
um, you'll notice that there are slight differences between them. And that's why identical twins are so fascinating because any difference between identical twins came from environmental factors throughout development and after birth um, to these twins. So uh, identical twins are really interesting in terms of science, looking at the effect of our environment versus the effect of genetics. So fraternal twins then are the other type of twins. And fraternal twins, the easiest way to explain it is that it's two siblings that have the same birthday, but they share nothing else. So that means that there was two eggs and two sperm that just some through, through some accident or some um, really cool occurrence, both of them were released at the same time. And therefore, the two individuals will be in the uterus at the same time. They'll develop and be born at the same time, but they share no genetic uh, similarities more than just a normal pair of sibling split. So this graphic kind of shows you a little bit better about those identical twins versus the fraternal twins or not identical twins. Um, interestingly, identical twins will have the same blood type and their fingerprints are very similar as well. And there's an article link there if you're interested in the fingerprints of identical twins. Pretty cool story, um, very, very rare occurrence. Um, there was one couple that kind of through an accident ended up having twins, but the twins were actually bipaternal twins. So they both came from the egg of one woman, but they were fertilized by two different man's sperm. Um, and this was actually a mistake. Um, this woman went through IVF or in vitro fertilization. And it turns out that when they were implanting the sperm into the mother's um, eggs, they didn't clean the utensil out, which meant another male's sperm got mixed in with her eggs. She ended up having twins, fraternal twins, um, but one of the babies was from a different male than the other. So kind of interesting situation there. Somebody else asked whether or not there's ever a possibility that two sperm can fertilize one egg and if that causes twins. So when I researched it, um, it's exceedingly rare. So we're talking less than 1%. And the reason for that is that when two sperms infiltrate one egg, it will actually give that, that, um, that zygote three sets of genetic information. So we call that a triploid individual. Um, because triploid individuals would have so much genetic information, there's a lot of complications that would arrive, and typically that individual would not survive past a few days of development. Typically that, um, that, uh, that embryo would not even implant in the uterine wall, and it would not result in any form of a pregnancy. If this would happen, probably would go undetected by the mother. It would be a miscarriage really early on, so probably she wouldn't even know she was pregnant. So I thought this was a good time. Um, what I'd like you to do is go ahead and take a little break, pause the screen, and just make sure that you're 100% comfortable with all of the structures labeled here. Um, I apologize, letter B was cut off. That's the top letter there. So go ahead and pause, see if you can name these structures. Awesome. So if you unpause, the correct answer is we're going to start down kind of at the bottom. That upside down dome-shaped object is our cervix, which is, uh, which is the, the lowest part of the uterus. Then we have our fallopian tubes up top that connect the ovary to the rest of the uterus. We have our vaginal canal, oops, the ovaries, which contain those, uh, the eggs or the ovum, and then we have the uterus here. So good job if you got all of those. So let's kind of look at a little bit more detail with each of these structures. So the uterus itself, um, its main job is to uh, protect any egg that would be fertilized and needs to develop. Um, because of that, the uterus is an exceedingly stretchable material. Um, so it's composed of a lot of smooth muscle that's able to expand to the size of a watermelon if the, the female is pregnant. Um, the fertilized ovum is going to attach to the inner wall of the uterus. Um, so the uterus's job is to create a very, very, um, a very uh, comforting and nurturing environment for that embryo to attach. Um, if, however, the egg is released and it is not fertilized, then the inner lining of the endometrium has to be shed so that infection doesn't build up. And that's, of course, what we refer to as menstruation. And we'll talk a little bit more about menstruation later. So I wanted to go through some common medical procedures and some things that you probably just need to know for uh, health of the female reproductive system. And that is that um, once a year, females uh, over the age of about 16, 17, 18, certainly once a, a female is sexually active, um, should visit their gynecologist and they should get what's called an annual exam. During that exam, the gynecologist will put a device into the, the vaginal canal and spread it open a little bit so that they can swab the interior portion of the cervix. 
Um, they also do a check of the environment. They can do STD screenings. They can do pregnancy checks. They're just making sure that everything in the female reproductive system is looking A-OK. -okay. What the swab is for, what that pap smear is for, is that they are screening for abnormalities in the cells of the cervix. Those abnormalities in those cells are a precursor to cervical cancer. So a pap smear is a screening process to try to um, pick up if a, a female has any abnormalities that would lead to cervical cancer. Thankfully, in the past decade, um, we've come out with a vaccine that screens for cervical cancer. Um, cervical cancer is called by, caused by HPV or the human papillomavirus, which is the reason why a vaccine can actually work because it's viral. Um, just as a, uh, a kind of note of caution, um, the Gardasil vaccine has been known to cause some complications, so it's definitely something that warrants a talk with your primary physician or your gynecologist. Um, they need to know your medical history, any um, history of blood clots or high blood pressure before they will, they will give you that vaccine. So it's a good idea to have a good long talk with your provider before you make that decision. Another type of exam that happens in the annual exam is that they'll check for the physical abnormalities of the uterus or the bladder. And they do that by inserting one hand into the vaginal canal and one hand onto kind of the top of the tummy. And they'll push down, you can see anatomically, that will allow them to feel the structure of the uterus and of the bladder. Um, so if there's any swelling of the uterus or if there's any cancer of the uterus, a lot of the times this screening can help uh, tip them off to that. So let's talk about the menstrual cycle or that 28 day month long cycle that occurs in females past puberty. So um, just as a little note, completely optional, there's a hilarious uh, video that I posted on the bottom left-hand corner about a girl getting her period for the first time. It's pretty funny, completely optional. You don't need to watch it. Um, but let's talk about what happens in the anatomy of the menstrual cycle. So interesting little tidbit about uh, the animal kingdom. We are one of the only animals in the animal kingdom that doesn't have an outside or really obvious signal that uh, a female is ovulating. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense that in the animal kingdom, you would want some sort of indicator that the female is fertile and ready to be, um, is ready to reproduce. Um, that would give a clue to the males that, you know, it's time and if you want to have an offspring, now is the time. So evolutionary biologists have a couple theories that I thought were quite fascinating. And they said that because humans have more developed social interactions, and because um, having a male care for their offspring is a huge biological advantage in humans, um, evolutionary biologists suggest that this is something that we evolved. So we lost any type of signal or indicator that we are fertile. That way males will always kind of think that a female is fertile and therefore spend more time with that female. And that has direct influences with offspring care. Um, so I thought that was an interesting little tidbit. The whole purpose of that 28-day cycle is not only just to release the egg from the ovary, it's also to make sure that the endometrial level is of the correct thickness. So you can see in the beginning of this diagram for the premenstrual cycle, um, the endometrial level uh, layer is thickening. And as you reach that menstruation period, um, the, the endometrial level will slough off and shed and go away. It's important to do every month so that that very nutrient rich, very moist and warm environment does not uh, give rise to any bacterial infection. So it's necessary to slough off that endometrial level every month to make sure that it is clear of infections. Then after that menstruation, the endometrium will gradually develop and thicken again over the next remaining uh, half of that menstrual cycle. Um, after the endometrium level has thickened to a good amount, ovulation will occur. So there's a very thin window where that egg is in the fallopian tube and the endometrial level is ready for implantation, that would be the period where the female is the most fertile. And of course, if that egg fertilization event doesn't take place, then we're back at the beginning of the cycle and that endometrial level will be shed again. I thought it was interesting, and even though this is an anatomy and physiology class, um, science is never taking place in a vacuum. And we always have to be aware of certain social um, certain social uh, events and certain social situations that are occurring in our world. Um, and unfortunately, there are areas of the world that are a little bit less developed than we, uh, we are here in America, where they don't have access to regular feminine products. They don't have access to any way to deal with their, their monthly period. Um, unfortunately, also in a lot of these countries, not all, but in a lot of these countries, a uh, female on her period is looked at as disgusting. It's looked at as unnatural and just dirty. Um, so in that time period, if 
a, a, a young girl gets her period, she typically will just either drop out or skip that week of school. And of course, that has um, very detrimental effects to the future of that female and having her um, graduate and be able to have a sustainable career. Um, so it kind of helps to perpetuate that cycle of poverty for those individuals that aren't able to continue school simply because they don't have uh, feminine products. So there's a lot that we need to do in 2020 to help kind of share and educate the world and also make sure that there are um, there's nowhere in the world where a girl can't go to school just because she's on her period. So um, that kind of brings us to a close of female anatomy. We're going to move on to pregnancy and development. Um, I thought this was interesting. This is actually an, an excerpt from an educational child's book that was published in the 1970s. Um, and you can see it's extremely cheesy, but it does speak loads about how far we've come with the social stigma about talking about sex. Um, in 2020, I would believe that, especially with the internet and with modern sex education, that talking about sex and talking about sex prevention and safe sex um, has come leaps and bounds from the 1970s, um, where we don't have to give a child an awkward book about sex education. So let's talk about how pregnancy occurs. So fertilization of the sperm typically happens in the fallopian tubes. So what that means is that um, after ejaculation in the vagina, the sperm would have to swim um, to the superior side of the uterus. And that sperm would have to travel a little bit of the ways through the fallopian tubes. So they actually have quite a distance to go, um, which is the reason why we talked about the seminal fluid containing so many things to help neutralize the, the pH of the, the uterus and make sure that it's a hospitable environment for these sperm. Once that egg is fertilized, the sperm and the egg's uh, nuclei will fuse, combine genetic information, and then we have our first cell called a zygote. This is about what we talked about before. And that zygote's main goal is to grow and divide, to grow and divide until it can implant into the uterus. Now, later this year, if we dissect cats, um, we'll notice that there's a slight difference between those cats' uteruses and the uterus of a female human. Um, and that's because cats have multiple births, they have litters. And uh, because of that, their uterus is a little bit different in shape. You can remember that the human uterus is quite large, looks like an upside down pear, but the uterus of a cat is much thinner and much skinnier, it's much shorter. Um, but instead of having large and long fallopian tubes, they actually have a very extended uterine horn. And that uterine horn allows for multiple embryos to develop at the same time. So this next slide shows on the right-hand side that shows that uterine horn full of little baby embryos. So we can see that this mother is uh, pregnant with nine different babies. And you can see to the left, that's an x-ray of a pregnant cat. So all of those babies are shoved on in there. And that's how multiple births are uh, accomplished in a lot of mammalian species. So remember that when fertilization occurs, it happens uh, with two gametes, so the egg and the sperm, that both carry 20 set, 23 sets of chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, one set of chromosomes, um, where they will combine in fertilization and create that zygote that will have the diploid number of 46. That instant of conception is known as a verb and a noun. Um, so we can say conception is a moment or conception is something that is going to happen. So um, that moment of conception essentially inquire, or requires a lot of uh, anatomical ingenuity in, uh, in the, uh, the sperm. So if we look at the sperm, it's divided into the head, the mid piece, and then the flagellum. And contrary to be belief, the flagellum does not weave back and forth like this. The flagellum is actually kind of a corkscrew that's turned that helps the sperm uh, perpetuate forward. At the very top of the sperm, the head of the sperm, is a tiny little capsule called an acrosome. And the acrosome is filled with digestive enzymes that will help that sperm penetrate the outside coating of an egg. So you can see that happen in this slide here. You see that the sperm will tap the very edge of the zone of the egg. The acrosome will burst and it will release those enzymes, which help them kind of penetrate through that zone and enter into the actual plasma membrane of the cell. Notice that there are protein receptors along the outside of the cell, and those protein receptors help to maintain a barrier um, so that other sperm that might be entering the cell's zone exactly at the same time, um, it will help block it, the other sperm so only one sperm can get through at a time. So that's how pregnancy occurs, but let's talk about how do we um, offset pregnancy. So what are ways that we can prevent pregnancy? So 
Um, before we talk about prevention, there are a lot of just uh, people that naturally have trouble getting pregnant. So one of the uh, treatments for that is IBS or in vitro fertilization. So basically that's when a man will gather a sperm sample and a doctor will be able to harvest some of the eggs from the ovary. Um, typically they try to ha harvest the eggs that are pretty near to um, maturation. Um, those eggs are then treated with estrogen and progesterone to get them to that mature status. And then the sperm and the eggs will be combined and the doctors will wait and look at them under microscopes until they can see that there's a feasible, alive and viable embryo. Then those embryos, <clears throat> and I do mean embryos because typically they, they um, inject more than one, will be put inside of the woman's uterus. Um, and it, the likelihood of that embryo to attach is pretty low, which is the reason why they do try multiple. Um, but that also is the reason why people who go through IVF a lot of times will be, uh, will more commonly have multiple births because a lot of times multiple of those embryos will attach at the same time, which is why people that have IVF are more likely to have twins or triplets. Okay, I threw this video in there just because I thought it was such cool science. Um, a lot of people wonder, you know, IVF, it happens outside the body. Will there ever be a port in time where we can make a womb that's outside of a female and actually develop a baby that's not being grown inside of a human? We are by no means there yet, but we have actually done an artificial womb for a lamb. Um, so this is an interesting video clip you can watch in your own time if you're interested. So this, uh, this diagram shows how um, teenage pregnancy has dropped over the past 20 years. So really in the past 20 years, we've come leaps and bounds with making contraceptives and sex education available for more people so that now there are less unplanned pregnancies than ever. If we look at the flip side of that um, and we compare maternal birth uh, age to the maternal, uh, to the years, we can see that um, as in the 1980s, the average age for a mother to give, uh, to have a child would be about 22, 23. And as we progress, we can see now in like this, this most recent decade that the average age for a female to give birth is now closer to 26, 27. And that age bracket keeps on rising. So what are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? Well, benefits are mostly like socially, are social and economic benefits. Um, anatomically, the peak years for a female to, to give birth would be between the years of about 19 to about 27. Um, but socially and economically, we're now more in a culture where, you know, in your early 20s, you might not be financially secure enough to support a child. You might not have a place to live to support a child, or you might not be um, with the person that you're going to raise that child with, if that's your choice. Um, so there are benefits of delaying motherhood. There are drawbacks simply because um, the viability of a female's egg starts to decrease after uh, about 33 years in age. So if you wait too long, the viability of the eggs will decrease and therefore you might have a more difficult time getting pregnant. So let's talk about ways to prevent that pregnancy. So some of these are probably pretty common methods that you've already been educated about. Some of them might be new. So um, most common barrier method um, would be condoms, both male and female. Um, some less common ones are sponges and diaphragms, but essentially they are just working as a barrier between the two sets of gametes, the sperm and the eggs, to make sure that, that uh, fertilization does not occur. There are also some options with spermicells or contraceptive gels that essentially will thicken that mucus level in the cervix so that any sperm that's ejaculated into the vagina won't be able to make that travel up into the uterus and fertilize the eggs. Um, there are also hormonal controls. So probably one of the most common types of birth control is the birth control pill. Um, so right now there are only options of birth control pills in females. Um, and those birth control pills use a combination of estrogen and progesterone, or there's also some progesterone only pills. Um, the delivery systems vary. So there's many different types of birth control pills, which is good because a lot of times you have to work with your primary physician or your gynecologist to make sure that your hormone levels are um, correct and that these pills will not impact any of the, uh, the normal cycles, the normal uh, influences of the endocrine system that you have. So um, a lot of you guys in the pre-quiz for this unit had a lot of questions about different types of birth control pills. Why is it you gain weight with some? Why is it um, some are some are different colors. Like, what is with those 
those six or seven pills that don't technically have hormones in it. So I kind of found a video that's a really, really nice job of summing up uh, what exactly those birth control pills do, the different types and the different side effects that they have. So we're not gonna watch it now, but that's available to you if you have any questions about that. If we move on from birth control pills, there are other different um, implanted devices that can help with birth prevention. Um, one of those devices is the NuvaRing. The NuvaRing is not blocking anything, but it is another way of delivering hormones to that area. So the NuvaRing is infused with hormones that would work to modulate those uh, hormonal levels and would prevent birth. NuvaRing is implanted every month, and then towards the end of the month, you remove it for seven days, the female will menstruate, and then you put a new one in um, the beginning of the next month. NuvaRing is a good option for anybody who has trouble taking the birth control pill at the exact same time every day, which is an absolute necessity if you are on the pill. There are also um, body implants that you can get that work as contraceptives. So there are, um, there are implants that can go into your arm that use estrogen or progesterone. There are also IUDs, so intrauterine devices. These devices will sit inside of the uterus and they will slowly release chemicals that will block fertilization. Benefits of IUDs is that they can last up to five years. Drawbacks is that a lot of people, um, their bodies do not uh, react well to IUDs, so sometimes they can cause complications, um, and they are quite painful to have installed the first time. So other options that are a little bit more permanent involve surgery. So there is, of course, the option that we talked about for males, which would be a vasectomy, where we separate those vasectomies from uh, the testes and the epididymis. And there's also tubal ligations. That just means either tying tubes or severing tubes, uh, ca cauterizing tubes, so that the egg that is released from the uterus will not travel to, the egg that is released from the ovary will not travel to the uterus or be fertilized. For um, females, sometimes a hysterectomy is an option, and that's when you either remove the full or a partial part of the uterus or the internal reproductive structures of a female. Um, a lot of times this is an option for females later in life, they know that they don't wanna have children anymore, so they'll have a partial hysterectomy that just removes the uterus. The benefit of a partial hysterectomy is that you still have your ovaries intact, and since the ovaries are the site of producing estrogen, you would still have the normal hormonal influences. A full hysterectomy, a lot of times as a result for those individuals that might have ovarian cancer or cervical cancer, um, or they're at a greater risk for that. When you remove the ovaries with the uterus, it means that you would no longer have any of the menstruation, you would never have any fluctuation of hormones. So it does mean that that female would no longer have a period and would no longer go into any of the normal phases of human uh, female development. A bunch of you guys had questions about Plan B. Um, Plan B is not a type of birth control. Plan B is the morning after pill. So Plan B is, uh, is a, uh, a chemical that would influence the development of that zygote. Um, it's absolutely imperative that Plan B is taken um, within three days of that unprotected sex. Otherwise, it does not have an effect. So um, there have been a lot of horror stories of females who have waited too long and then tried to take large amounts of Plan B. Um, it will not terminate the pregnancy, but it could cause absolutely disastrous results for that developing fetus. So definitely make sure that um, the directions are followed. Um, in Pennsylvania, Plan B is able to be bought over the pharmacy, uh, over the counter at a pharmacy. Um, but I believe there is an age restriction. I think it's above 18 that you have to be in order to get it or else you have to have an adult purchase it for you. Um, of course, if none of those options work, then abortion is still a legal option in the United States. And of course, this is a very controversial subject. You guys are mature enough to understand that. Um, we won't get into a lot of the controversy, but just the actual anatomy of it is that um, a young fetus would be removed via a vacuum apparatus from the uterus, um, sometimes in whole and sometimes in part. So we already kind of covered sex determination. This is just a reminder that when the sperm and the egg fuse, they bring with them one single sex chromosome. Um, so the, the, the myth is true that if a father is really preoccupied about the gender of the baby, it really is up to the father because the mother will always donate that X chromosome. The father has an X or a Y to donate. So it's really the sperm that determines the gender of that baby. Um, there are other events called trisomy events where um, through a non-disjunction event in meiosis, you will get uh, three copies of one chromosome instead of only two. So one of the most common of those is trisomy 21, that is known as Down syndrome. All right, so let's move on to indications that a woman is pregnant. So how do we know? 
So there are physical symptoms that a female would register, like uh, tenderness in their breasts, nausea, um, fatigue, and then there's the more concrete pregnancy tests. So let's talk about what those actually test for. So in pregnancy tests, um, the most common type of pregnancy test involves a female urinating on the end of a, a, a material piece called a stick. And the urine will be wicked through the stick and carried the whole way through the rest of that device. And what these uh, urine pregnancy tests are designed to do is they test for a hormone called HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. This is a hormone that's produced by those outside cells of the blastocyst, we'll talk about those, and it's produced um, as early as one week into pregnancy. So that's why some of these pregnancy tests are so accurate early on. So the deal is there are two strips on a pregnancy test. One is the control and one is the one indicator that uh, you are pregnant. So if we look at the image to the left, top down, if we look at letter A um, for a pregnant female, the pregnant female would urinate on the stick and that urine would contain the HCG. The HCG would be picked up um, in the base of the stick. So as that urine kind of wicks through the rest of that, that structure, um, it would be picked up by these receptors. The receptors uh, then would bind with, with the HCG to that orange receptor, which is actually a pigment receptor. So if the HCG is pregnant and it binds to the other receptor, those orange pigment receptors will actually change color. And that's what that physical stripe is actually showing. Um, there's also a control stripe. And the reason why that control stripe is necessary is that these pregnancy tests do expire. So we wanna make sure that if we're getting a positive test that we're not getting a false positive. So if um, on the left, that pregnancy test, those receptors are present and they're working, uh, two stripes means that it's a positive test. One stripe means that it's a negative test. If there would be a stripe next to letter C and not one next to letter D, it means that the pregnancy test is invalid, that it is expired and it shouldn't work. So always in science, another perfect example of why the control group is absolutely necessary. So what happens if the woman is pregnant? So that positive uh, pregnancy test comes about. Well, that moment after fertilization, the very first egg that would be created, the very first cell that would be created is that zygote. That zygote's job is to divide and grow and divide and grow until eventually it divides into this thing called a blastula. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So after that first fertilization event, that zygote over the first day is gonna spend time growing in size fusing its, its nucleus between the sperm and the egg, and then dividing. We call this cleavage. That two-celled uh, ball of cells is then going to split and split and divide and split until eventually it's about 164 cells big. Now that 164 uh, cell mass is actually hollow. And we can see in the last slide or the last uh, cell on this slide that when you look at a cross-section of that, that hollow mass those outside cells of this thing called the blastula are eventually going to develop into the, the uh, placenta. The inner cells inside of that blastula will develop into what will become the fetus. So this is showing that same process from a different perspective and it's adding in where the egg is at in the fallopian tube at the time. So fertilization again typically happens in the first third of that fallopian tube. Um, and as cleavage and division occurs, typically by the time the, the fetus is a blastula, it is entering the uterus. And that means that when it enters the uterus, that blastula is then going to embed in the endometrial level and be able to develop the rest of the way there. After that point, so after that, that uh, embryo is developed or is embedded in that endometrial level, a process called gastrulation is going to occur. So this is basically the development of the GI tract or your digestive system. It's also the development of the three different levels of what we call germ layers. So what happens is that hollow ball of cells will actually start to infold and it will make a tube inside of a larger sphere. So that infolding of the tube will actually start to set up these levels called the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And we can see that that infolding is actually going to create a tube within the tube. If you remember anything about our digestive system, we always made reference to the fact that humans are just a, a beautiful squishy tube, um, meaning that we have two openings, our mouth and our anus, and we're just a big long tube in between. So that gastrulation process is the beginning of the setup of that giant tube. So here we can see that on the very top right hand corner that that gastrulation is going to make two different layers. And as those layers smooth out, we're going to create this kind of disc. So you can see on the image to the bottom right 
the disc has a top layer that's called the ectoderm, which will develop into your body tissues, like your skin and your nerves and your teeth and your eyes. Then in between there is this layer of tissue called your mesoderm. So that's everything that you kind of think of as being inside of you, like your organs, your blood, your lymph, your, your bones, your spinal cord. And then anything um, beneath that, so the yellow portion is called the endoderm. And basically what that means is that's going to be the inner lining of your digestive system. That's the inner part of that tube that makes you up. Um, after gastrulation, after we kind of have those three layers suspended in on that disc, we have this process called neurulation. And in neurulation, you can kind of hear the clue of that term, it's gonna have something to do with the nervous system. So this actually will create something called a primitive streak. And this is named because it literally looks like somebody took their finger and is drawing a line in the clay. Um, and this primitive streak is basically going to cause a line to form in those three layers of germ. And it's going to infold that line and create a hollow tube, which will eventually become our notochord, which is our spinal cord in our brain. So that neural tube, when we look at that infolding, the top portion of it, that blue portion will give rise to the brain and the bottom portion will give rise to the spinal cord. Now, this is a really good animation put out by Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We're gonna watch it on mute and we're gonna watch it fast forwarded so that I can kind of walk you through it and we don't have to go through it uh, for a long amount of time. But if we look at this process, here's our egg traveling down the fallopian tube. Here's ejaculation with the sperm uniting with the egg. This is the moment where the hormones are going crazy inside of that egg and the two nuclei are freezing, freezing. Then that egg will then divide and divide and divide. We're now four cells, now eight cells, then 16 cells. And you can see we've now left the fallopian tube and we are in the uterus. We're now at the stage of a blastula and that blastula will be able to implant into the uterine wall. We can see if we cross section that blastula, we have the inner mass of cells that will develop into the fetus, the outer cells will develop into the placenta. As that inner mass of cells moves, gastrulation is going to occur, and that's going to create those three layers of germs. So the, the ectoderm, the endoderm, the mesoderm. We can see the primitive streak has just happened, and we're gonna see infolding of the notochord. We'll see elongation of that embryo, and for the very first time when we turn out in cross-section, we start to see that the beginning of a human form is coming. Um, that process is all going to happen within the first 24 to 30 days of development. So it's happening pretty dang quick. So let me jump back in here. Beautiful. So if we look at that process in another way, we can see that um, we can see that day one through day seven is kind of when um, that cell is going to be growing and dividing and creating those three different germ levels. Um, in day seven, we have the implantation, and then by day 18, we have those different layers that are starting to create and develop that embryo. Day 25, or day 23, we have the development of those little uh, chorionic villi on the right-hand side that are represented in yellow. We can see the umbilical cord folding, we can see the neurulation occurring, we can see the amniotic cell, uh, sac enlarging, and we can see an embryo starting to take place. Um, this is another good way, another good diagram to show how the embryo is actually going to develop. Um, we can see in this structure that um, the embryo really starts to take form. Um, and technically, an embryo is called an embryo up to eight weeks of development. Anytime after eight weeks, it is called a fetus. So this is the very end of embryotic development. After this stage, um, this individual will become uh, a fetus. So we can see in the structure, we can see the umbilical cord being um, attached from the embryo to the rest of the placenta. We can see the amniotic sac is represented in blue. So we are part of a larger division of mammals called amniotes, meaning that we are born of an egg. Um, and so that amniotic sac is what that fetus will be swimming around in for the next eight to nine months of development. We can also see the placenta and there's maternal and fetal placenta and basically those two are kind of intertwined with each other to allow diffusion of material between mom and baby. We can also see the chorionic villi and the chorionic villi um, are the site that will allow a type of pregnancy screening called a CVS or a chorionic villi sampling. So let's move on to fetal development. So we're past embryonic stage. We can see that this takes place between day 35 and day 45. 
Um, we can see between 35 and 45, that's only 10 days. But in those 10 days, we can see the beginning developments of the jaw, the ear. Um, we go from having paddle-shaped forelimbs to having limbs that have actual little digits and little hands. We can also see horrifyingly that we have a tail at this stage of development. Uh, but no worries, that tail will eventually shrink, it'll shorten, and it will simply combine into our sacrum and coccyx at the very end of our vertebrae. Um, in this screen, we can see a little bit past that, that previous stage of development. Um, just keep in mind the larger numbers, the 13, 14, 15, those are called the Carnegie stage. Um, don't need to worry too much about that, but underneath them, you can see the days of development in parentheses. So we can see this is the development in the first trimester. First trimester is roughly the first <clears throat> the first 14 weeks of development, 13 to 14 weeks. So we can say in those short few amount of weeks, we really go from just a little tiny nugget of a fetus to a full-blown um, fetus. We can see fingers and toes um, and all of that development. A lot of you guys had some really brilliant questions about what organs develop when, what's the last organ to develop? Well, this uh, chart kind of shows the development cycle of a fetus and of the embryo. We can see the first thing to develop is actually the brain and spinal cord. So a lot of you guys thought the brain only develops past 15 weeks of development. The brain is developing in the first couple of weeks. Um, it continues to develop throughout the rest of the growth of the baby, but it's technically there very early on. The heart is the next thing to develop and followed by some structural components of arms, legs, ears, and eyes. And then of course, um, the external features are gonna be the last to develop. The one thing that is not on this diagram that I think should be is the lungs. So the actual organs of the lungs are gonna develop midway through um, that time period as a fetus. But for the lungs to actually be functional, they're one of the last things to develop. And that's the reason why a lot of times if an infant is born premature, they'll have to be hooked up to a respirator. We also learn in our respiratory system about those things called surfactants that need to be produced inside the alveoli of the infant's lungs. Those are the things that allow that infant to open up and breathe air for the very first time after birth. So, Again, this is a really, really good uh, video that shows you kind of a time warp of the, uh, the conception to growth to embryo to about childbirth um, stage. So I'll let that there in case you are interested and you can watch that on your own, okay? So there are also uh, a lot of changes that happen internally to a woman who is pregnant, not just in the, the, the baby's development, but in the woman's development being pregnant. Um, and if you've ever been around a pregnant person, they'll always talk about how the baby is squeezing their organs and it's really uncomfortable. Um, and you have to imagine that the inside of our abdominal cavity, which we learned a lot about, is pretty jam-packed with organs. Yet in that same amount of space, we're trying to pack an entire baby that may weigh eight or nine or 10 or 11 pounds. So um, towards the third trimester, you can see the impact of having that baby weighing down in the bladder, squishing all of the organs to the side. And it also puts a sizable amount of pressure on the spinal cord and the vertebral uh, column, which is what causes the lower back pain and some of the spasms involved with pregnancy. Um, a couple of you guys had questions about morning sickness. So believe it or not, even in 2020, we don't know 100% what causes morning sickness. We do know that it has something to do with that hormone. We talked about the human chorionic gonadotrophin hormone. Um, all we know is that this impacts the, uh, it impacts the digestive system, and we know that as levels of HCG, HCG spike, so do nausea and vomiting. So I wanted to go through some fetal tests that are options when you are pregnant. Um, the first test, the most common, is an ultrasound or a sonogram, same term. Um, so the sonogram and the ultrasound basically are when the doctor is able to put a device on the outside of the mother's stomach that will project sound waves through the lining of the stomach and into the baby. Um, so what those uh, machines will do is they will register the sound waves that bounce back from the, the baby and they'll be able to produce an image because of that. Um, we've now had enough technology advances that we can now get 3D sonograms, which will allow you to see the baby's um, three-dimensional features, which is kind of amazing. There are two tests that are rather invasive, um, but if you're at a high risk for certain um, chromosomal mutations or certain diseases, these are good options for the mother and for the baby to make sure that you are ready and prepared for whatever might occur. Um, the first test is called an amniocentesis. And amnio, you know, that first word kind of comes from the word amniotic. And that means that they will inject a giant needle through the belly into the actual uterus and through into the amniotic sac. 
um, they will gather amniotic fluid, which actually has cells that have sloughed off of the surface of the baby. Um, this is extremely accurate because you're actually testing the cells from the baby themselves. Um, but as you might uh, kind of infer, it's rather invasive because you're sticking a needle pretty close to that baby. And babies are very rarely still in utero, which means that they're going to be kicking and flipping around, which means there are um, potential risks of damaging the baby, also infection because you're puncturing the amniotic sac and the placenta or and the, the uterus. Um, another option is through fetal cell sorting. So there's a type of test called the NIPS test or the non-invasive pregnancy screening where they will draw blood from the mother and there are three different types of DNA in that blood. There's the mother's DNA, there's DNA from the placenta, and then there's DNA from the fetus as well. Um, it is a little, it is uh, still very accurate, but uh, it's able to be done early on in pregnancy and there's absolutely no risk for this test for the fetus. Um, so let's talk about what happens when it's time for that baby to actually be born. It's the process of labor itself in all of its horrors. So contractions for labor, we now know um, because of our other study of anatomy that uh, the contraction process is a positive feedback system that uses um, the hormone oxytocin and it is stimulated by the pressure that's put on the cervix by the baby's head. So we can see that um, as labor uh, starts, the cervix, which is what we're looking at here in this model to the left or to the right, um, the cervix is relatively thick and it's relatively closed. Um, as contractions continue, the cervix will actually get thinner um, until it is 100% effaced. Effaced means that that cervix will go from being kind of a tube and a cylinder to being flat like a pancake. After the cervix is effaced, um, it will start to separate and that's what dilation is. Braxton Hicks are types of contractions. They are less uh, in-depth contractions. They're usually what they call fake contractions um, or uh, false contractions that are a warning that the woman is ready to go into labor, but they don't actually produce the child themselves. Um, the dilation of the cervix is what allows the, the baby's head to pass through it. So a woman needs to be dilated at least 10 centimeters before the baby can come out. If you want a good judge of what that is, that is a small cantaloupe or it is the diameter of a very large New York style bagel. So imagine that for a second. Um, one of the options during pregnancy is something called an epidural. And this is something in pregnancies that are going really long or if the mother is, is struggling a lot with pain. Epi means surface and dura means the portion of the spine in between the vertebrae and the, the ribs. Um, so basically they take a big long needle and they inject drugs into your epidural um, that will allow the mother to feel less pain in her lower extremities. When we look at the birth process, we can go top to bottom through the three phases of stage one. Um, the first phase, we can see that cervix is relatively thick and it's closed. The active phase, that cervix has become effaced. The transition phase is when that cervix is starting to dilate and the baby's head is starting to crown. Stage two is when the baby is actually physically coming out of the external part of the mother. And stage three is when the baby is out, but the placenta still needs to be passed and the umbilical cord is the one that is connected. So this shows you what a baby with a connected umbilical cord looks like and what that lovely, delicious looking placenta looks like. Um, so if things don't go well with that normal delivery, there's an option for a cesarean section. And basically that's when a doctor will cut a small C-shaped uh, slit into the very bottom of the abdominal cavity of the woman and the baby will be removed surgically. So this is typically uh, the only option for risky surgeries or if a baby is in a difficult position for delivery natural. Um, this is just a reminder that babies are very, very infrequently cute when they're first born. They're usually slimy and covered with goo and blood, um, but hey, they get cuter. Um, most of the times the amniotic sac will be punctured and will drain its fluid. That's what breaking the water is. Um, but this shows an image of the baby who has been delivered from the um, from the uterus, but has not been uh, freed from the amniotic sac. So this is during a cesarean section. So let's go through some complications with birth. So one of the uh, complications that would lead to a C-section would be something called a placenta previa. And this is essentially when the placenta becomes detached early or late on in development, and it blocks the cervix. Um, so this can cause early bleeding in pregnancy um, when the woman gets uh, closer to labor and the usual result is that you need to have a forced C-section. 
There's also a complication called breech birth, um, which is when the baby, instead of being head down later in birth, um, they're butt down, which means that they either need to be delivered via C-section or there are some maneuvers you can do to try to flip the baby prior to birth. We talked a little bit about an eptopic pregnancy. To remind you, this is when a uh, fertilized egg would implant into the lining of the fallopian tube instead of the uterus. This is exceedingly dangerous for a woman because as that fetus would grow, or sorry, as that embryo would grow, the fallopian tube would stretch and it is not meant to be wider than a piece of cooked spaghetti noodle. Um, it can lead to complications for the woman. It's been known to, lose, uh, to lead to a lot of blood loss for the mother and even death for the mother. So typically in these situations, as soon as it's discovered that the mother has an ectopic pregnancy, um, that pregnancy is terminated, they go into surgery, they remove the embryo. Sometimes the mother would have to lose that fallopian tube and they would do like a partial uh, tubal, uh, tubal ligation where they would tie off that side of the, the fallopian tube. Um, another common uh, pregnancy complication is gestational diabetes. Um, and when you think about developing a child inside of you, your immune system is kind of thrown out of whack because its main job is to determine whenever something is foreign inside of your body. And all of a sudden you're giving rise to a new child which technically has different cells and different DNA than yourself. So there's a lot that happens in your immune system. One of those effects is that sometimes um, insulin is blocked from doing its proper job. And if that occurs, then it means that the mother is basically um, going to be thrown into a temporary diabetic state, which would mean that um, that it needs that mother would need to have synthetic insulin. They would need to watch their, their um, sugar intake, and they would also need to monitor the baby more frequently. So that's a common test that's done um, as a glucose test early on in pregnancy to make sure that you do not have uh, gestational diabetes. One of the, uh, the last complications of pregnancy we'll talk about is preeclampsia. And this is one of the most commonly screened uh, pregnancy complications because it's one of the easiest to indicate and the main indicator is high blood pressure. Um, this can be due to damage of an organ system. It can lead to kidney and liver damage, which is very, very um, dangerous for the mother which is the reason why when you're pregnant, they check your blood pressure all of the time to make sure that you uh, do not have preeclampsia. If they do have preeclampsia, the only thing you can really do is deliver the baby preterm. Um, and it's, you're able to develop, deliver the baby um, really, really early on. I mean, there are preemies that were born um, three months early, two months early, and just the earlier they developed, the more increased they have for developmental um, complications. A lot of times they have to be hooked up to feeding tubes and, and respirators until that baby can breathe and eat on its own. So um, this was a very, very brief uh, intro, our introduction to um, female reproductive system, to pregnancy, contraceptives, development, and birth. I hope that this was helpful and I will see you guys in class.